Hello. Take two. I am Sasha Muppet. I'm trying to produce a video to tell you about proning and why we do it. I've already gone live once, was happily teaching. You couldn't see what I was teaching you. My wife, who was watching me, <laughs> told me that. So this is why we prone, take two. I promise you'll be able to see the screen this time. And you can hear me. Yes, you can hear me. Yes, you can see me. No, you can't see my screen yet. So let's just go on to talk about why we prone, making sure that you can see the screen. There we go. There's my screen. So why do we prone? OK, so there's three parts to this that you need to understand as to why we prone. But before we start, we need to talk about ventilation and perfusion. OK, so let's start with that. So ventilation. Ventilation basically is about getting, sorry about my writing, is about getting air into the lungs. So air into the lungs. OK, so that's the first part of helping the patient breathe. But the second part, which is just as important, is perfusion. And that is the blood supply to the lungs. So if one of those is missing, you are not going to get a, uh, a patient who is breathing particularly effectively. So if you've got poor ventilation, so you can't get air into the lungs for one reason or another. Um, most commonly with the uh, COVID patients is because they've got a pneumonia in there. It's full of nastiness, um, making that um, ventilation difficult. Then if you've got that, it doesn't matter how good your blood supply is you're still not going to have a patient who uh, is oxygenating particularly well. If you've got poor perfusion, so the blood supply to the lungs is compromised, um, you can ventilate those lungs as good as you like, but you're still not going to have a patient who's well oxygenated. And an example of that, a classic example, uh, is uh, uh, a, a pulmonary embolism. So if they get a clot in their circulation. But that's not what we're talking about here. So ventilation and perfusion. So let's just understand those terms first. Okay. So the first part is we need to talk about the shape of the lungs because that's crucial when it comes to the ARDS process. OK, so imagine now you're looking at the patient um, from the end of the bed. So you've got their feet closest to you and their head at the far end of the bed. OK, uh, and we've taken a slice through them a bit like we do when we do CT scans of the lungs. So the shape of the lungs are like this. And this is exaggerated, really, just to make my point. They're not exactly like this, um, but ultimately, this is what they look like. OK, so what we've got, we're talking here about the alveoli, but the first point we need to make, and let's just make this clear. So this is the patient's back and this is the patient's front. OK, what's important to know is that at the back of your chest, there is good perfusion a good blood supply and that's regardless of whether you're on your back or on your front it doesn't change it will be well perfused regardless of your position and that's quite important okay now the other thing to remember in ARDS is that the lungs are getting boggy full of fluid and they're like a sponge so if you lay a patient on on their back that fluid will all drain downwards okay, due to gravity. So that's the dependent part of the lung at the back. So remember, they're full of fluid, all of which is draining downwards. So now we've got the lungs full of fluid at the bottom. Because of the shape of the lungs, the alveoli will also be slightly different shapes. So what happens is that you've got a few alveoli up here which are reasonably well opened. But as they spread out and there's more weight of the lung on top of them, they're going to start to get really squished because they've got the weight of the lung on top of them and they've got all that fluid as well. They can spread out in all this space. So a lot of your lung will fall down to the back because it's got the room to do so. And as a consequence, a, they're falling where the fluid is going, so they'll be fluid filled and they're getting squashed as well because of the lung that's on top of them. OK, so what does that mean for the patient? Well, quite simply, it means that the ventilation perfusion ratio is poor. So we've got 
good perfusion but unfortunately what we haven't got is good ventilation okay all these alveoli are shut small they're full of fluid we've got cracking perfusion got poor ventilation these alveoli up here are well ventilated but we haven't got such a good blood supply up there we've still got a decent blood supply but it's not as good as a blood supply at the back regardless of the position of the patient okay so what do we do we're going to turn them over so if I just minimize this bear with me so if I resize this and get it out of the way so now what we're going to do is we're going to turn them over so the shape of the lung is going to look slightly different so now the shape of the lung is going to look like this okay so now we've got the patient's back and we've got the patient's front okay because they're lying on their front now and remember that this area here is well perfused okay the back of the chest is better perfused than the front of the chest whether the patient's on their front or their back that doesn't change okay that's a constant okay um, the fluid is still going to drain that way so you're going to get all your fluid down here um, it's going to drain downwards the dependent part of the lung but the, the effect on the alveoli is going to be slightly different. And this is what they sometimes call the slinky effect. Imagine you've got a slinky in your hand and you drop it and it will just gather down at the bottom, okay? The, the lung is obviously tethered to the walls. Uh, it will gather in the dependent part of the lung. They call it the slinky effect. I don't know whether that's a useful analogy or not. Um, I don't find it that useful. If, if you do, then, then great. Okay, so now what we've got is we've got the lung dropping down, but there's only a limited amount of room for the lung down at the bottom here because of the shape of the chest wall okay so not so much of the lung can now drop downwards okay which means that you've now got more of the lung up here which hasn't dropped down because there isn't room for it to do so because of the shape of the chest wall which also means that this is now better ventilated okay if it's better ventilated, not only is it now better ventilated, but remember, it's also well perfused. So now you've got a better VQ matching. You've got better ventilated alveoli in a well perfused part of the chest wall. So that's one reason why proning works. There's two more reasons why we think proning works. So again, let me just reduce this. Okay, the other reason why we think proning works is because of the um, abdominal contents. So let's do that one first. So the abdominal contents, and forgive me, my drawing isn't excellent, but now imagine you're looking at the patient from the side of the patient. Okay, so you're at the side of the bed, uh, you're looking down, you're looking at their arm and, and the side of their head. All right, just to explain because my drawings aren't brilliant. All right, so this is the patient's torso, this is the patient's legs. Okay. And here is the patient's diaphragm. Now, again, remember that this is the well perfused. And this is their back. This is their front. So this is the well perfused part of the chest. Because remember, lying on your back, better perfused than your front. But what's happening is that the abdominal contents tend to fall down and backwards. Okay? So they fall down and backwards which means that they are exerting quite a lot of pressure on this part of the diaphragm and on that part of the lung so now if you remember um, if you remember uh, our first diagram that this is where all the alveoli are already a bit squished already a bit full of fluid and now they've got the abdominal contents lying on them as well okay so we're gonna flip the patient on the front remember so if I get this one out of the way as well 
and you'll be able to compare. Let's make this a bit smaller. Right, so now we're going to flip the patient on their front. So excuse my drawing again, but I'll try and represent it. So this is their back. That's their bottom and their legs. And this is the patient's front now, okay? So we've got their diaphragm still going there. Um, but now we've got the front of the patient and the back of the patient. And again, this is well perfused because the back of the chest is better perfused. And remember, I said the abdominal contents will move down and backwards. So this is what's going to happen. So down and across that way, down and across that way. But remember now that we've got the patient on their front with the first part of the uh, talk that we did, the better perfused alveoli are up here anyway. The squished ones, of which there are fewer because of the shape of the chest wall, are down here. They're the ones having the pressure on them, but it doesn't matter so much because now we've got the better perfused, well-ventilated alveoli away from the abdominal contents as well. So that's less pressure on them as a consequence of putting the patient on their front. One more reason. Let's just minimise this first. So we just get that out of the way. The last reason is a much simpler reason, and we're not absolutely sure how big a part this plays. Um, but again, remember that the patient's chest, now the patient's standing up. So well, they wouldn't be standing up, but imagine the patient's standing up. OK, so now I've got the patient's shoulder here. OK, arm here. OK, I'll just get rid of the arm because it's kind of just going to obscure our view. But remember now that we've got um, we've got the back of the patient and the front of the patient. And in there, you've got the heart. And I deliberately drawn the heart slightly towards the front of the chest. Now imagine that this patient, the heart is slightly towards the front. So imagine now that this patient is lying on their back. So again, on their back. Their heart is now resting on the lungs because it's going to gravity is going to have an effect on the heart as well so the heart is now resting on all these alveoli squashing them it's just something else that's going to be squashing the alveoli that possibly is going to compromise the patient's breathing okay but if we turn the patient on their front so let's turn the patient onto their front uh, my drawings are getting worse but anyway on their front with their heart there, the heart is now going to be falling downwards. So this is the front. This is the back. The heart is now going to be falling backwards and resting on the sternum, not the lungs. So it's not going to be squashing those alveoli, which is something else which is going to improve our oxygenation. So they're the three reasons. So it's to do with the shape of the lungs. It's do, to do with the effects the abdomen has on the lungs when the patient's lying on their back or their front. And it's to do with the, the, the way that the heart will rest on the sternum or the alveoli, depending on the patient's position. So that is why we think proning works. I hope this is useful. I'm going to post this on YouTube as well. Um, if you've got any comments or you want me to do any more of, of this kind of stuff, then just let me know. Um, but I thought that might be useful for people to understand because we are going to be doing a lot of it.